good evening everyone so today uh, session we have two talks one by me uh, about the management of uh, bone defects in a primary scenario then dr tarun will be speaking about uh, intra op post op uh, protocols and uh, which also includes all about cocktail and everything so let's go to the first talk So is it visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. So the management of the bone defects in a TKR, whether it is a primary scenario, whether it is a revision scenario, should start with the preoperative X-ray assessment because your eyes will see only what your mind knows. If you fail to assess your defects in the preoperative x-ray or the preoperative period you end up with these type of surprises and it will be very difficult to manage these defects intraoperatively so always see your x-rays very carefully before uh, you plan your surgery so bone defects in tkr are most commonly seen in primary scenario than a, uh, in revision scenario than in the primary cases these are again most commonly seen on the tbl side and associated with severe deformities so various causes which are proposed for uh, bone defects are the developmental uh, issues which is basically the hypoplasia of the lateral femoral condyle mainly in the valgus knees osteoarthritis in conditions of inflammatory arthritis previous fractures or tbl osteotomies in conditions associated with bone cysts and tumors there are various classification proposed for the bone defects but i will be concentrating only on a few things so based on the location of the defect rand classified uh, dor classified them as central and peripheral so this is a central type of defect on my left hand side and the peripheral defect also called as marginal defects on the right side so the central defects are usually associated in a valgus knee and usually these are contained defects on the lateral tbl plateau while the varus knees have a posterior medial defect and these defects are peripheral in nature so you can see in the valgus knees the defects are central while in a varus knees it is peripheral defect or a marginal defect so based upon the margins whether they are contained or non contained again they are defined as contained defects with an intact rim of cortical bone and surrounding with the deficient area while the non contained defects are segmental in nature and they are more peripheral in nature so this is a contained defect this is a marginal defect based on the size rand classified into four categories and each category is subdivided based upon the intactness of the rim into a and b so one type is a defect less than 50 mm in the single condyle of depth less than 5 mm in type 2 it, it it is up to 50 to 70% of the single condyle and depth is more than 5 but less than 10 and type 3 and 4 they are more uh, widespread in the single condyle with more than 10 mm in the depth the most commonly uh, Uh, uh employed classification is a ora classification that is anderson orthopedic research institute where the type 1 defects are with intact metaphyseal bone these are the minor defects not compromising the stability of any implants while the type 2 defect that is type 2a has a little bit damage in the metaphyseal bone usually in the one uh, tbl condyle or the femoral condyle while type 2b it is again having a some deficit in the metaphyseal bone and involves both tbl and the femoral condyle the type 3 is more uh, way, uh, ex uh, exhaust type where uh, the metaphysis is deficient significant loss of the bone uh, over a tbl or a femoral condyle so how are you going to manage this defect either by minimize the defect or you uh, by translation of the component and reconstruction of the defect So let us address each one things. So 
so when you want to minimize the defect so it is not advised to take your cut at the level of base of the defect because whenever you are sacrificing more and more amount of the tva the surface area or the uh, strength in the tva decreases because as you come down the uh, the more and more cancellous bone will be there and there are high chances for failure of your tbl component so if you can see uh, at 2 cm there is a strength decrease by 23% while at 4 cm the strength decreases at 27% so always try to minimize your defect and the defect whichever is left after your tbl cut has to be addressed with different forms which will be dealt in the later slides so the other way is to translate your component this is just shifting the component away from the defect commonly employed in a conditions where your peripheral defects of less than 50% of the condylar area so in these condition you use a smaller component and then you sacrifice the bone which helps to minimize the defect the finally we will come to options of reconstruction of the defects after you have taken your tbl cut or after you have translated your component still there is a defect and these are the ways how you can uh, reconstruct them so the various options are cement bone graft you can use wedges or blocks you can use metaphyseal fixation device or a mega prosthesis these metaphyseal fixation devices or mega prosthesis usually are more towards revision scenarios very rarely you will get a situations where in a primary scenario you will need these options the so cement is usually uh, required when the defect is less than 5 mm and involve less than 10% of the condylar area or it is also used in ari type 1 where there are cystic defects the advantages of the cement are it is simple it is very inexpensive it is available because you will be going to cement your components and you can mold your cement in any shape and size you need but the downside with the cement are it has a poor mechanical support there is risk of fragmentation are associated with thermal necrosis so whenever you want to use the cement the defect area should be made raw so you can see this example where the defect is less than 5 mm and it is a marginal defect so here you need to uh Uh, a drill hole uh, with 2 mm drill bit uh, which are 2 mm apart 2 mm deep and uh, uh, convert this sclerotic area uh, into multiple drill holes so that more and more osteo integration can happen in the future then you use a pulse lavage to remove all the fat and the uh, blood debris and then uh, you will do the cementing procedure so this is how you can use your cement to fill the defect of less than 5 mm in uh, depth next is screws with the cement so it is usually advised in conditions where you have a peripheral defect of less than 25% of the condylar area that is ideally in a marginal peripheral defects so these screws help in load transfer from the prosthesis to the underlying bone you can see the picture where the defect is around 5 to 10 mm the screws you can use either 3.5 mm or 4.5 mm in case of 3.5 mm use 2.7 drill bit in case of 4.5 you use 3.2 mm and see that your uh, screw placement is away from the keel preparation so sometimes uh, you can prepare your keel then under the vision you can uh, guide the direction of the screws then another option is a bone grafting so these bone grafts can be auto grafts from the bone cuts available or you can take the iliac bone graft or allografts like the femoral head distal femoral or proximal tibia so bone grafting is usually used in the conditions where there are 50 less than 50% of the condylar area and a depth of more than 5 mm i am going to give you an example see this patient with uh, implant in c2 with uh, grade 4 oa once the dcs is removed there is a big void in the anterior cortex of the femur so we have thoroughly washed the debris we have 
uh, the the base of the defect is thoroughly uh, uh, curated out for the fiber fatty tissue. Then we impacted with the cancellous bone, and then we did the routine cementing. So this is how you can uh, avoid these type of big voids using an autologous bone graft. The advantages are again it is cheap, easily available. It preserves the sub strong subcondyle bone, and it has a versatility to fit any shape. Disadvantages again the risk of non-union resorption and a collapse. Then there is another technique which is developed by Skalco, which I will be demonstrating here. Here it is for usually the defects around uh, 10 millimeters in uh, depth, which are marginal defects. You want to reconstruct this defect using the bone cuts. So take this example. You can see this example where after the trial uh, TBL processes is uh, placed, uh, there is a defect of almost 10 millimeter. The first important thing is to you make the sclerotic bone raw. You remove all the sclerotic bone, take the saw, you remove all the sclero sclerotic portion. So once this is done, you can see here the uh, fresh cancellous bone is exposed. You take a thin uh, drill bit or a K wire, do a multiple drill holes. Then you take uh, one of the chamfer cut or a distal femur cut or a posterior cut. You reverse the cut and then stabilize it with a K wire and fix this graft with two screws. Once the screws are placed, you just take the saw and gently uh, smoothen the surfaces so that there are no bumps uh, wherever the graft is placed. So this was a case of a primary complex case where the defect was around 10 millimeters. We, we reconstructed and then we put an extension rod. So whenever you want to address the defects of more than 20 millimeters, you have to use an extension rod because these help in transfer of your uh, load from the bone under the processes by about 30%. And also you have a better prosthetic stability. Now, uh, these stems are of two types. They can be cemented or an uncemented. Some people use a uncemented one. Uh, but whenever you want to use an uncemented one, you should have a press fit in the diaphysis. Or the other way is you can use a short stubby stem, which fills only the metaphysis, but you need to use a cement there. Then other options to address your defects are using a metal augments, which can be wedges or blocks. Again, these are advised when your defects are Ratnakar, we can't hear you. I think he'll reconnect.
Sir is reconnecting, sir. I think he lost power. Uh, Tarun. Sir. Uh, I think uh, Ratnakar sir has lost the connection. Do you want to start it? Uh, he said he'll log in, sir. We'll wait one more minute and we I'll start if sir is not able to log in. Okay. Okay, I think sir just joined. I'm sorry. <laughs> Guys, I'm sorry. There is some connection problem. Fast and Uh, Tarun? Yeah, I think I'll start off then. Yeah, I think we'll give uh, Sir a few couple of minutes to get back. I think maybe yeah, you can start your presentation meanwhile so that... Is my screen visible? Yeah, yeah, it's visible. Yes, sir. Good evening, everyone. Sorry about that. Uh, anyway, we'll go ahead uh, with the next talk while uh, Sir reconnects. So I'll be talking about the operative protocols that we use in uh, total knee arthroplasty. This includes both the intraoperative and uh, postoperative protocols that we follow. So now that we all know total knee arthroplasty is one of the most uh, successful and successfully performed surgeries all over the world. And that being an elective surgery, you should always take care of all the medical comorbidities and optimize the patient before you proceed. And the aim of the so-called care plan is to enable patients to safely undergo the surgery and recover quickly and uneventfully. So the timeline of care provides the caregivers, that is the surgeons, with the opportunities to optimize patient outcomes. So till now, what we have discussed in all these uh, past weeks is only the preoperative phase and up to the surgery phase. But that is only two steps in the patient's journey. Still, the patient has to undergo recovery not only in the hospital, but also at home. And later on, he has to get back to his daily routine activities. So for the sake of convenience, the phases of care are divided as uh, follows. The, as you can see, the care for the patient begins preoperatively. That is, even before the surgery starts and during the time of counseling, we always try to optimize the patient. And all, these, uh, all this has already been discussed in the first session. So coming to the uh, phases following surgery, we have the immediate postoperative phase the mobility phase up to six weeks, the intermediate rehabilitation phase up to three months. And lastly, the last phase is the return to his uh, activities. So what is this uh, word protocol that we keep using? Is it necessary and uh, do we really need it? The answer is yes. A surgical protocol is basically a document or a performer that a surgeon follows, which enables him to, which enables or guide, guides him in decision-making regarding the patient's diagnosis, management, and treatment in specific areas. 
the main reason for this for these protocols to be developed is to standardize the care in your institute or your hospital so if you have a protocol you always reduce chances for the potential errors and you always have a predictable plan of action so coming to the protocols and guidelines that we commonly use in total arthroplasty we'll be looking at uh, these protocols under these following headings i will be showing you what we as sunshine institute follow in, in all these headings and also the supportive literature uh, based on which these uh, protocols were developed firstly coming to pain management as we all know pain management is without a doubt the cornerstone for success for a totally arthroplasty because that is the main complaint with which a patient comes to you and your main promise to the patient is that the pain will be less after surgery and suboptimal pain management usually results in a prolonged hospital stay prolonged uh, functional immobility increased consumption of uh, analgesics and opioids and poor functional outcomes and overall dissatisfaction of the patient so that is why this concept of multimodal analgesia has come into play so multimodal analgesia basically means that you start pain management not after the surgery but even before the surgery during the surgery and finally after the surgery there are many modalities by which uh, by which pain can be managed during each phase of the patient's journey and we'll be going through each one in detail so first you have to know that there are many groups of uh, pharmacological uh, medications that are available that is that i that is used to manage uh, the patient's pain the groups are you most commonly the nsaids the gabapentinoids paracetamol that we all use we also have opioids and also steroids so the next question is when do you use which and how do you use them as you can see the main ideology behind uh, multimodal pain uh, pain analgesia is you target pain at each level so as you can see on the table in the left your the site of action of each agent is shown so you target pain not only at the level of the brain or the spinal cord but also up to the level of the skin or subcutaneous tissue preemptive analgesia this is the first uh, procedure that we start even before the surgery is taken uh, this is usually started 3 days prior to surgery or again the duration prior to surgery is debatable and different papers come up with uh, different duration but what we follow is 3 days prior to surgery the patient is given tablet lyrica lyrica is nothing but pregabalin 75 mg bd tablet celecoxib which is a cox2 inhibitor and uh, pa 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 pantoprazole which is an antacid so once the patient has taken this preemptive analgesia and come to us uh, for the surgery intraoperatively what do we do to manage pain first thing is for the surgery to go ahead uh, the intraoperative uh, an anesthesia per se is decided by the anesthetist so it's usually a spinal epidural or general anesthesia that we all know in our uh, institute what we follow is a single knee that is a unilateral total knee replacement usually receives a spinal anesthesia and epidural anesthesia is generally reserved for patients undergoing bilateral total knees the next thing that next intraoperative pain management pathway is in the form of local infiltration analgesia or what we uh, so call the cocktail and lastly there is a steroids also so what is this uh, cocktail that everyone keeps uh, talking about it is actually a mixture of uh, chemicals or uh, med medications that we inject directly into the wound around the wound so that the patient uh, receives maximum benefit of analgesia so this cocktail should be divided and infiltrated into multiple sites which i'll show in the coming slides and the cocktail should always be prepared under sterile precautions usually in our case the ot technician themselves prepare the cocktail and steroid should steroid which is a constituent of the cocktail should be given to all diabetic patients this is one thing which is uh, which you have to note so this is the cocktail regimen that we follow for a single sided knee you can take a screenshot of this uh, if you like the left side shows the co constituents of the cocktail we have uh, injection ropivacaine which is an anesthetic ketorolac which is an nsaid 
adrenaline, which is a vasoconstrictor, methylprednisolone, which is the steroid, and then it's all finally diluted with normal saline. And all these have to be injected in the sites that are uh, shown in the table on the right. Uh, the, it has to be divided and injected into each of the following sites. And when, when do you inject this cocktail? This cocktail is usually injected after all the bone cuts are taken and after you give a wash and just before cementing, that is the time when you inject the cocktail. Steroid usage, again a controversial topic, but we do follow the use of uh, steroids intraoperatively. So the first dose of steroids is given 60 minutes prior to the incision. We give 8 mg of dexamethasone and the second repeat dose is given one day after surgery usually in the SICO. And again, point to be noted is it will be given both in diabetics and non-diabetics. However, you should keep a watch of the patient sugars. So what do you do once the patient, once you've done the surgery? Again, one more thing that we uh, often follow immediately in the OT itself is the, uh, is the adductor canal block. So it is a single shot adductor canal block, which, which contains 20 ml of injection 0.2% ropivacaine, which is given by our anesthetists under ultrasound guidance. And this is done immediately after the dressing of the TKR is done. So once the, shift, uh, once the patient is shifted to the SICU, what do we do? We usually put a 30 degree head up position. All patients receive IV fluids. Vitals of all the patients are mon monitored and we break uh, NBM usually four hours post spinal or six hours post general anesthesia. Once the patient is shifted to the SICU, all patients are seen by the anesthesiologist and the DMO. All their uh, preoperative uh, comorbidities are taken into account, and whatever the medications or advice were given by the respective consultants is also taken and documented. And all these patients receive their post-operative x-ray in the bedside itself. We send a CBP, a renal function test, and electrolytes and ECG for all the patients the next day. All patients are seen by physiotherapists the next day, immediately after surgery, and they are made to walk. And they are given spirometry exercises if saturation is less than 90. And before shifting the patient out of the room, all patients are seen by the anesthesiologist. So in the, in the SICU itself, what is the pain protocol that we follow? We usually give paracetamol 1 gram IV TID, Buvelor, which is buprenorphine patch, 5MG is given on POD0 itself. Again, point to be noted, we don't give a buprenorphine in old age patients more than 70 and asthmatics or COPD patients as it is known to cause respiratory depression. Pregabalin also is the same given at the night of surgery and BD following that. So what, what if the patient has more pain? Whenever a patient has more pain with this conventional line of drugs, it's called as breakthrough pain. And if a patient has breakthrough pain, we follow the step ladder in the management of these patients. So first we give fentanyl. If fentanyl 30, 30 micrograms is also not working, we go ahead with morphine. And if morphine also is not working, then we do a repeat adductor canal block. And all this to be noted is done in the SICU. So what, what happens next once the patient is shifted out of the SICU? Again, we give paracetamol TID till discharge. Dolo from POD2 onwards, that is once the patient is shifted to the room. But now once the patient is in the room, the breakthrough analgesia protocol is a little different. We give uh, selecoxib, which is a COX-2 inhibitor, NSAID, 100 mg if the creat is okay. Again, if this patient still has pain, we go with the injection Diclo, which is an NSAID. And lastly, if patient is still having pain, then we go ahead with tramadol. And oral metaclopramide or ondansetron is usually given along with the opioid. So once pain is managed, the next most uh, threat to the orthopedic surgeon or especially an arthroplasty surgeon is infection. So the general measures we take to prevent infection are number ah. one. Is, hello. Ah. Yeah. Ah. So the general, general measures. Who? General Jonathan. measures. Why? Wow. Ah. So for infection prevention, we uh, our institute all all has uh, laminar flow OTs. We avoid ah. shaving. 
Yeah, and next coming to the antibiotic protocol. The main antibiotic protocol that we follow is we yeah, only Rathak, give three fixed doses of injections of your Sorry, you are trying to say grams. something to me? No, no, no. Uh, can you just unmute, unmute? Unmute. You want me to unmute? unmute. unmute. Ah, mute, unmute. mute. You were unmuted. Mute. Now. I'm so sorry. Extremely sorry. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. It's it's okay, sir. So coming to the antibiotic protocol that we follow. Uh, we generally give three fixed doses of antibiotics for all primary TKRs. That is cefuroxime, 1.5 grams BD is the, is the dose we follow. So one is given at the time of surgery, just before incision. The second dose is given 12 hours after surgery. That is usually in the night at the SICU. And the third dose is given in the morning in the SICU before shifting out. And point to be noted here again is that no extend, extended antibiotics are used. We do not give an, a further dose of antibiotics even for diabetic patients, inflammatory arthritis patients, or any other patient undergoing primary TKR. The next thing, next guideline is uh, prevention of uh, DVT. DVT again is a balance that we all need to adjust. The idea is to prevent thromboembolism at the same time avoid uh, bleeding risk, which leads to wound complications. So again, the consensus is that there is no optimal or ideal drug for uh, the in the prevention of DVT in arthroplasty. There is no one recommended drug, but whatever the drug they drug you use, 14 days minimum is the duration of the anticoagulant or antiplatelet agent that needs to be used. So the commonly used DVT prophylactic agents are aspirin, apixaban, and low molecular weight heparin or clexin. Other than that, the newer ones, dabigatran is also used. Warfarin, our currently outdated, not generally used. Fondoparinox also is used. And also physically by using mechanical pumps to the calf can also be, is also a measure to prevent DVT. So this was a recent trial which uh, compared aspirin versus low molecular weight heparin, which recently concluded the last year. And as you can see, they found that the inoxaparin group or the low molecular weight heparin group which is clexane, had lesser incidence of DVT at the end of 90 days. So what is our what is our protocol that we follow for the use of DVT? So on the day of surgery and uh, till the patient gets discharged, we use clexane for TMG subcutaneously given OD. From POD2 onwards and on discharge, the patient receives Eliquis 2.5 grams BD for 28 days that or one month. But however, patients having previous history of DVT or any other uh, thrombotic phenomenon needs to be consulted with a ca cardiologist or vascular surgeon, and they will decide on what the anticoagulant protocol should be. Next, the blood management protocol. Aaron, Aaron, yes, sir. Just wanted to make one point here. Yeah. And just go back. <clears throat> so one yes. point uh, to be learned, or you should keep in mind when you want to give clexin and uh, spinal epidural. So it is very important that when you keep you your uh, spinal plus spinal epidural, your plexane should be given minimum 9 to 12 hours after the epidural. For example, if the patient is operated at 9 a.m. in the morning, you can give your plexane only at 9 p.m. in the night. And on a POD1, when you want to take off your epidural catheter, it should be 12 hours after the last injection when you can take off your epidural catheter. Once the epidural catheter is removed, again, you need to wait for 12 hours before you give the second dose of flexin. So please make a point here. Suppose if you give flexin in the morning 4 a.m., you cannot take off your epidural catheter morning 9 a.m. It is minimum 12 hours after the flexin. You take off the epidural catheter and wait for another 12 hours 
before your next dose of flexane. Yes, sir. Next, coming to blood management. So this was a good paper which uh, deals with the current concepts regarding blood management in orthopedics. They define anemia as a hemoglobin less than 13. It's, ma it's majorly uh, cause of concern in patients uh, undergoing bilateral and uh, revision TKs. And always uh, they suggest investigate and treat reversible causes of anemia prior to surgery. There is no need for a in routine cases, there's no need to screen for uh, bleeding disorders unless the patient gives you a history. Aspirin can be continued perioperatively. This is another important point to note. The earlier uh, sayings that aspirin should be stopped five days or three days prior to surgery does not hold. And aspirin can actually be continued along the, during the course of surgery. Restrictive transfusion thresholds of 7 to 8 grams hemoglobin. That is only if the hemoglobin is dropping below 8 grams, should you consider a transfusion and not before that. Tranexamic acid should be used. Surgical approach, they say, and tourniquet use is based on surgeon preference and training. And drains are not recommended. So these are the tranexamic uh, acid guidelines that we follow. So again, Tarun. So yeah. the, uh, the uh, data, what you have mentioned, that hemoglobin less than 30 as an image. Yes, so yeah. this has been revised in our Indian population to 11. Yes, so I'm coming. I'll come to that. Yeah, yes. yeah. So again, uh, the tranexamic acid is given at a dose of 10 mg per kg in 50 ml of saline solution, administ administ which is administered over a time of 10 minutes after induction with the spinal. The main contraindications for the use of tranexamic acid are uh, age less than 16, allergy of course, history of seizures, previous history of uh, thromboembolism or other thrombo thrombotic phenomenon, and severe kidney impairment. So what are the transfusion guidelines that we follow at our institute? Uh, we generally, a WHO cutoff even though is uh, 13 in males and 12 in females. In the Indian population, we have noticed that we use a cutoff of 11 for males and 10 for females. That is the cutoff that we use before going to surgery. For unilateral cases, uh, hemoglobin with no comorbidities, there is no need to reserve blood. Uh, the, sorry, there is need to reserve only one unit of blood if there are multiple comorbidities. For bilateral cases, we use the formula. So if the hemoglobin is less, we transfuse one unit prior to surgery. That is the patient gets admitted one day before. Uh, at the time of admission, one unit is transfused and one unit is kept reserved, which is usually transfused after surgery, depending upon the hemoglobin level. If preoperatively the hemoglobin is less than eight, always uh, refer to the general physician or hematologist and make sure that the reason for anemia is found out and it is dealt with. Again, we transfuse uh, postoperatively only if hemoglobin is less than eight, along with a clinical correlation, anesthetist and physician opinion. Next, coming to the other common medical complications, which is UTI. Everyone has a doubt whether you can go ahead with surgery in, with, in patients with urinary tract infection, which is very commonly seen in old age females. So according to these papers, uh, even though diagnosis of UTI says that more than 10 to the power of 5 uh, culture for colony forming units has to be present, they again categorize UTI into whether it is symptomatic or asymptomatic. So a preoperative, uh, these papers have also noted that preoperative UTIs within one week of uh, TKR is associated with higher incidence of prosthetic joint infection. And also they found that indwelling urinary catheters should be avoided so they may, <clears throat> the main conclusion they found in most papers and what we also follow is that symptomatic urinary tract infection should definitely be treated before proceeding for the total knee replacement. However, asymptomatic bacteria, that is only the presence of back, uh, back, uh, bacteria in urine is not a contraindication for surgery and it should not be a cause for concern. And we avoid catheters even in both our unilateral as well as bilateral patients also. So after all this is done and after you've taken care of everything, when do you decide whether the patient is fit for discharge from your hospital? So we generally use three criteria. First thing, if the patient is able to walk independently using a walker with for at least 50 steps, 
and he has an adequate pain control, which is a VAS score of less than four and patient is able to get out of bed and use the restroom, he is considered fit for discharge. So once the patient goes home, the next most common complication that all the not only the surgeon, but also the patient is concerned about are wound healing complications. The most commonly seen complications are persistent wound drainage, stitch abscess, wound dehiscence, and surgical site infection. So what do you mean by persistent wound drainage? The ICM 2013 definition states that if it is if there is a more than 2 into 2 centimeter uh, staining of the dressing beyond 72 hours, that is beyond 3 days, only then it is considered a persistent wound discharge. And one more thing is if the persistent wound discharge is there beyond day, beyond day 5, there is an increased risk that it will progress to a prosthetic joint infection. However, it Point to be noted again is most cases resolve spontaneously, but you should have a thorough watch. So how do you manage patients with persistent wound discharge? Again, we use absorbent dressings like uh, Mepilex. You can always use compressive dressings to stop the soakage. If patient is having excessive wound soakage, the, do not uh, hesitate to stop physical therapy for a few days till the wound, till the wound drainage stops. In high-risk patient, revision or obese patients, you can also consider the use of incisional VAC application. And again, one point to be noted is avoid antibiotics if there are no local signs of infection or inflammation. When do you go ahead with surgery? You only go ahead with surgery, which is just a local debridement, only if the persistent wound drainage is persistent beyond seven days. Next common complication is a stitch abscess. A stitch yes, sir. From previous slide. So again, uh, you should consider about uh, to temporary withhold your uh, anticoagulants or antiplatelets if you are yes, using yes. in case of persistent wound drainage. And this is a condition where the mechanical uh, uh, pumps are advisable when you want to stop your anticoagulants. Yes, sir. And there's no role of uh, culturing that uh, discharge or there's no role Correct. of uh, Correct. Yes, aspirating sir. the joint. Yes, sir. Next most common complication is stitch abscess. Stitch abscess is basically an inflammation uh, and discharge that is confined to a local site, usually the site of where you take your stitches, usually seen in the inferior margin of your incision. Discharge is usually scanty and usually you may see a stitch tip which, which is exposed or coming out and you can remove it at if it is visualized. Again, in this case also, we do not recommend the use of antibiotics. Then the next uh, commonly seen wound complication is surgical site infection. So a surgical site infection also is limited to the skin and subcutaneous tissue and usually occurs within the first month. It is associated with frank purulent discharge. It is associated with clear signs of erythema swelling and local rise of temperature. Always get inflammatory markers, which is your complete blood count, ESR and CRP done in such cases. And plan for a simple debridement. Always send cultures for such cases with purulent discharge and use appropriate antibiotics for seven days. Now, what is a deep surgical site infection? This also occurs within one month. However, the patient will have systemic findings of fever and local inflammatory findings. Elevated markers, that is patient will have a high, high leukocyte count, ESR and CRP both will be elevated. Again, the plan for such cases is, debri is debridement and antibiotics. And if you find that the infection or the purulent discharge is coming from under your arthrotomy or is it or it is still deep, then you should always plan for a dire, which is nothing but uh, exchange of your modular component like your polyethylene. So another main concern is, okay, now all these complications are there. So when do you say that your patient may be developing or may be going for a prosthetic joint infection. So if your patient has local signs of inflammation, patient has pain with rest and with movement, patient has fever and there is tenderness around the incision site and your lab values show elevated uh, CRP more than 72 hours and persisting beyond seven days of surgery, then it is most likely that your patient is going to develop a prosthetic joint infection and you should intervene. So how do you, how are patients followed up? When do you call your patient back? How often do you see them? 
and all that is the follow up protocol so i'll be talking to you about the follow up pro protocol that we follow in our institute so basically always have a database of all your cases develop your own techniques and routine for your patients have both pre op and post op scores to understand how your patients are doing over time and just don't operate and forget this is the uh, follow up protocol that we use in our institute at the one month follow up usually the patient is seen by the registrar and consultant again no x rays are advised at one month routine medical advice and medical referrals are just are done at 3 months the patient is uh, usually seen by our boss the first post operative x ray after the after the immediate post op uh, period is done at 3 months so once this x ray is done again we evaluate all the scores and uh, how the patient is doing and usually the scoring is done by one of our fellows at 6 months again 6 months post surgery again there is no need for uh, an x ray just take your routine scores and see if the patient is progressing well and also note down and clarify any of the symptoms he may have at one year follow up is when we do a x ray again we take a long leg scanogram just to see if alignment is maintained or if there is any deviation from his uh, post op alignment scoring is done and again they see again patient is seen by boss so the main take home message in all this protocol talk is the surgeon should refine their protocol and should maintain a standard protocol in their institute for all patients. There is no need to use any fancy drugs for the management of pain and prevention of DVT. There is no need to use fancy equipment like uh, CPM machines, neurostimulators, etc. in early rehabilitation. Always follow the concept of multimodal pain management. Again, these protocols may slightly vary institute to institute, but the principle still remains the same. And develop a protocol, get consensus from your colleagues, localities, and always stick to it. And last but not the least, always stay updated with published literature of what is in and what is out, so that you can offer the best care for your patient. Thank you. Any questions? Sir, can you elaborate questions on regarding this? Uh, hello. Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, sir, Tell can me. you elaborate something uh, post op uh, rehabilitation in form of exercise? Uh, what there exercise? There is a talk on this. Sir. That, that, that is a separate class, sir. There is a separate okay, class on uh, rehabilitation. Rehabilitation and physiotherapy will be discussed in a separate session, the next session. Sir, uh, what is the uh, motto behind the using the uh, steroids in the uh, operative? Operative? Everyone, please mute your uh, audios except the speaker, please. Uh, sir, uh, what is the cause yes. behind uh, using the steroids preoperatively and postoperatively? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, from Ortho TV, can you please see that everyone is muted? Can you please repeat your question? Uh, sir, can you tell what is the uh, motive behind using the steroids preoperatively and intraoperatively? Uh, so, preoperatively, we don't recommend the usage of steroids. Sir, missile penicillin 4 mg you are advising preoperatively one day prior to surgery or just before to the surgery? No, no, we are not advising preoperative usage of steroids. It is only intraoperatively that it is given as a stress dose, mainly to prevent inflammation and reduce pain. It is only two doses which are given. Yeah. Okay. So like Tarun said, it is steroids act as an anti-inflammatory and steroid bring down your usage of um, anti opioids. opioids, everything. Sir, can you use uh, tranexamic acid uh, as a, in intraoperatively by soaking it in a gauze and will put inside the before to uh, yes. closure. Yes, there is a role. Yes, tranexamic acid can be used both IV and local. Yes, it can be used. So, tranexamic acid, again, you see there are various ways. There are studies which has compared IV versus local versus combination where it is proved that intravenous is much superior in preventing the intraoperative blood loss rather than only uh, using your local infiltration of tranexamic acid. 
सर यू आर टेलिंग द यू आर यू टोल दैट कि आफ्टर दी ऑपरेटिव प्रोसीजर इन एस आई सर्जिकल आई सी यू यू कैन पुट द हेड थर्टी डिग्री ऑफ बट दिसंग दैट इफ दीज पीपुल आर प्रोवैडिंग द स्पाइनल एनस्थेसिया द हेड शुड नॉट बी ऑफ सो हाउ कैन यू वॉट विल रेकमेंड टू द पेसेंट because the post operative the headache may be persisted as per the anesthetist uh, yeah we so mainly use it to prevent uh, the post operative headache from developing actually if the head is flat there is a more chance of developing a post operative headache but i don't think there should be a problem with just uh, 30 degree elevation that is basically a pillow putting a pillow And below uh, the head this more post op spinal headache is most commonly seen when you make your patient sit completely Life flat Yes. not like 30 degrees second thing it is seen most commonly in younger population most of your population yeah. are geriatric population and next thing again it is common when you patient is dehydrated so give yes, your ma'am. patient adequate hydration that itself will prevent your post spinal headaches okay uh, sir uh, we people are use uh, you people are not using the drain uh, suction drain If we yes. put suction drain, uh, what will the complications you are thinking about? So usage of drains is associated with uh, more bleeding first, uh, increased chance of infection also if kept for prolonged duration. So in order to prevent that, we avoid usage of drains. Sir, after more doing blood it, loss associated with okay. more blood loss also. More blood loss, yes. so we will provide a compress dressing after the uh, skin stitching and uh, over that we can put some uh, crepe bandage uh, in this way or uh, only compression bandage is enough uh, post op dressing so, uh, so what we follow is immediately after the surgery we do a compression dressing on the day one that is we do always a dressing change immediately the next day in the sico itself and during that time we just do a normal mapilex dressing we don't use a compression dressing after that okay thank you sir so again ah. here, there are two things whenever you use your tourniquet if you want to uh, avoid drain you need to deflate your tourniquet get yeah. thorough hemostasis before you close your orthotomy so yes. that you know there is no visible blood loss and after your compression dressing it will take care there are people who don't um, deflate the tourniquet they uh, before uh, their orthotomy closure so that is a place where uh, your drains are recommended so that uh, any bleeding in the uh, wound should not form an hematoma or uh, increases the risk of infection so in your, those condition you can use your drain sir sometimes we observe that ke at the pin site uh, there is some kind of wound uh, oozing uh, so can you use uh, bone wax there it is not uh, utter deployment no 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 not not recommended no that will stop on its own with compression okay sir in post op period sir uh, 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 can you put your limb in elevated position uh, 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 by putting pillow below to the uh, operated limb or uh, again just... again not uh, recommended in our institute but yes some people do follow it but we do not uh, follow that okay thank you very much sir Yeah, Dr. Yeah. Ramay. Yeah, sorry. So I had uh, these two questions. Uh, uh, you uh, because most of our patients we always catheterize, especially the male patients. So you said that you don't put a Foley catheter. So yes, but in all the cases, that is one thing. And if you put a catheter, do you extend the antibiotics in that case more than three doses? And the second question is, do you use a long knee brace after uh, for these patients after TKR? so first uh, regarding the usage of catheters we don't use catheters in any of our patients whether it's unilateral or uh, bilateral and uh, whether you have to increase antibiotics if the if you use a catheter again is a question mark but again there is unless the patient has a symptomatic uti prior i don't think there is any need to recommend a prolonged duration of antibiotics or extended use of antibiotics and regarding Rambay, the yeah, the yeah. first question uh, the only indication where we catheterize in our patient is who have urinary incontinence yeah and that no. too that too we try to put uh, during the perioperative period 
and try mm. to take it off at earliest. Otherwise, you don't use urinary catheter in any of the patients. Okay, because most of our patients, they uh, develop uh, retention post-op. So we nowadays, for TKRs, usually put a, uh, in OT itself, but we put a folies. Next day morning, you remove that. So, that's so again, Abhi, you are using only spinal or you are adding or epidural anesthesia with it? We are using long acting spinal. So, we use chloridine in spinal. You know. So, you are not doing epidural, right? No, no epidural. Okay. So, again, adding an epidural anesthesia will add on to this urinary retention. We yeah. use we give only spinal. Right, right. Okay. And um, that long second knee, question you can answer. Long knee brace, do you use? No, we don't use unless we find uh, there is some sort of, uh, you know, laxity or uh, an or an MCL tear or something like that. It, we usually don't use a long knee brace. Okay, right. And do you use uh, Rivaroxaban uh, or you have now stopped using that uh, as DVT prophylaxis? We use only Apixaban, 2.5 okay. milligram twice a day for 14 days. Okay, no, yeah. uh, you don't follow up with it with EcoSpring later on? Because we no, no, we are not giving. Yeah. Right, yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Sir, uh, have you uh, noticed that there is some lateral hypostasia over the lateral aspect of the knee joint or the leg? Correct. What, what uh, you people are recommended, sir? Uh, post op period uh, tablet y solon prednisolone or something like that the, uh, or you are just assure the patient this type of, this thing will uh, uh, will go out uh, as the time passes yeah see again it is very commonly seen in most of our patients it is because yes. of injury to the infrapatellar branch of your saphenous nerve which supply yeah. the lateral part of your incision again here you need to reassure a patient Usually, we say that these things are going to persist for around eight to nine months. And sometimes from a large area, it is going to condense to a small rupee coin size. Uh, but over a period of time, patient get adapted to that. Only place where we uh, suggest your vice loan or anything is that uh, post-incisional dermatitis, where patient is having some lesions on the uh, one side of the uh, incision. And it is severely itching for them. Only in those conditions, we advise that. Psoriatic arthritis psoriasis is present over the knee. Uh, how can you proceed for uh, TKR? Psoriatic arthritis in general is uh, not a contraindication. So as long as there is no active inflammation uh, and it's just a psoriatic plaque, you can just you can continue with your uh, standard midline incision. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, and please continue your DMA RDS in the perioperative yes. period. Do not stop them. Yes, sir. Sir, my question is regarding exploration after infection. You said do you explore after seven days. So what's the criteria of exploration or whether it is a localized exploration or a complete washout? Uh, so again, it depends on uh, what type of discharge the patient is having. If the patient is having a purulent discharge with uh, symptom with systemic signs like uh, fever and also all the markers are elevated, you will obviously plan for a full exploration. So you will again open the wound along the site of incision. You will see if the purulent uh, the purulent uh, pus is coming from deeper tissues or it's just limited to your subcutaneous tissue. And then you will uh, decide whether you want to go deeper or not. But it is after seven days only, you said. Correct. Yes. Yes. About the ESR and CRP, you follow any criteria for that? Value you are asking, sir? Yeah, yeah, values here. Yeah. Uh, specific values as such, but I hey, think it is the actually CRP uh, third. Uh, quantitative so value is not about period, the quality, yes, sir. Yeah. See, again, and second thing, you're... Oh, sorry, Kushal, please carry on. No, I was just saying, uh, for re-exploration, I think what mm. the question was about the persistent leak, right? Mm. Yes, sir. He was asking at what value of ESR or CRP would you decide to go for a debridement? No, it's not about the value. It's about the... Yeah. 
So once you have established the definition that okay, it's beyond the seventy-two hours, it's crossing, it's causing two by by two centimeter square uh, within twenty-four hours, and um, you are given seven days of uh, conservative management by stopping anticoagulants, stopping physiotherapy, giving compression, all of these. Despite all this, yeah, uh, by tenth, eleventh day, you still have that leak. Then it's a time for exploring, and that exploring is never uh, a small. uh suppose you get it at the inferior aspect of the wound you just open there and uh, deprite nothing yeah. like that you have to do a full wash over yes it's always always a, mostly a complete wash over yeah, yes yeah. always in an ot not not in your minor ot or dressing room so what uh, fluids or what type of exploration uh, you do uh, can you i mean oh, uh, what same type same approach open media par- parapetera then uh, complete wash out we give 9 liters of uh, normal saline, saline wash out yeah and, and then send and change. send for cultures before yeah yeah and because the always change the poly because not because that poly is spoiled but because only when you remove the poly you get access mm-hmm. to the posterior capsule so then remove the poly give a wash out and because the poly could have gotten damaged change and put a new one thank you and this time you put a drain Don't this come out without a drain. Then you give a wash out. Thank you, sir. If culture is positive, do we give antibiotics for three weeks or just seven days, sir? Six weeks. So that Tarun was telling seven days was only for superficial site infections. Yes, not that is when you infection. Yeah. 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 Correct. Okay, sir. Sir, do you still give uh, steroids in diabetic patients, sir? Yes, yes. It is safe to give the uh, steroids even in diabetics. A single or two doses of Lexona is not going to shoot out the sugar levels of your patients. Yes. For re-exploration, you use tourniquet again, or yes, not? Yes. In infected cases, you can use. with tonic you you can use a tonic but do not exaggerate it pardon do not use the ash march or anything and exaggerate uh, for infection okay. cases okay thank you sir when we find out any infection and going for a revision two stage so how long you wait for ideally sir is there any time exact time limit or is there any variation so again it is like a uh um, suppose if you have done your deployment and your spacer in c2 then you should see uh, clinically how the wound settles down you sh- you should have a watch on your triple markers that is your esr crp and total count whether they have a decreasing trend or not wound healing then uh, at, every, at every two weeks you repeat these values if you have okay. a downward trends then you can finish off your antibiotic course for 6 weeks then you can have an antibiotic holiday for 2 weeks repeat your ma- markers then you can go for your uh, stage 2 okay so uh, you are telling that uh, six, you can any infection is there six weeks treatment you are telling no? how many days yeah. you will give iv antibiotic to how many days will give oral antibiotic so, so, so again that? again the first two weeks is iv antibiotics by the end of 2 weeks if you have a significant drop in your markers wound is settling well patient is feeling comfortable with respect to pain inflammation everything then you can switch over to switch the or... oral oral antibiotics so again it depends on what is what type of organisms you have isolated yeah what the culture okay. shows matters yeah sometimes we get an uh, knee aspiration culture negative so post surgery so at that time how to think whether to go or not to go how do you decide how do you go with those again like uh, kushal sir said you will have to see how the wound is progressing and how the discharge is so if the patient is having discharge first you will do is you will stop your antiplatelet or anticoagulant drug then you will put a compressive dressing and you will stop the physio also despite all this if the patient is still having persistent wound discharge and the uh, markers are elevated that is a good sign for you to go in and debride 
was your question that after 6 weeks of antibiotics the culture negative what to do right yes sir that that is also one of the my question was after giving an antibiotic still i have a doubt dilemma i aspirated still have my cultures are coming negative because of the antibiotic it is coming negative we have a doubt at that time how to think or whether so to go sense, or not so they say that it is a downward trend of your esr and crp with the clinical symptoms that is what important you have to serially monitor your esr and crp every two weeks and see how it is progressing if there is uh, if they are both are reducing in a serial declining fashion then it means your infection is resolving and you need not go in you can wait and watch oh. sir the regarding one bone defect uh, whether to use a cemented stem or a uncemented stem is there any specific or any better or you can just come out with that uh, any defect bone defect more or less as than as long as it is a primary scenario a short and a stubby stem is uh, sufficient you can use whenever you use a short stem you can cement it okay yes. i am at to complete my talk okay sir thank you <laughs> if uh, if the questions are finished for this session then i'll con continue with my bone defects yeah ratnakar start yeah yeah so the uh, i spoke about uh, cement cement with screws uh, bone graft uh, segmental bone grafting and now about the metal augments these are advised if you have a defects of around 5 to 20 mm these defects uh, help you support if there are more than 25% of the tibial base plate defect um, so the advantages of these blocks or wedges is that they are very efficient in load transfer when compared to cement or cements with screws and you need not wait for the graft incorporation you have an options of various sizes and shapes but the downsides again are the cost associated with it and second thing in fact you may need to remove more bone for that particular uh, wedge or the uh, block to fit in so if you see this load simulation uh, the first thing which will fail when you are using only cement to uh, to reconstruct if a defect which is a big defect is the cement then fails your cement with screws and the last thing which will fail is the metal wedges so in other words whenever you have a big defect the custom uh, metal wedges are more uh, 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 potent and more uh, load uh, load transfer than comparing to the cement or cement with screws so just to conclude if you have a defect of less than 5 mm you can use just cement with multiple drill holes you have a defect of 5 to 10 mm you use a cement with screws or a bone graft whenever it is more than 10 mm defect you use your bone grafting or augments and you have a metaphyseal bone loss you use your metaphyseal fixation devices which is very less commonly used in a primary scenario so if you will not plan your defects properly your tkr is going to fail like this so please plan your tkr and your bone defects properly well before the surgery and keep in your armamentarium the necessary things thank you Sir, will you be showing us a video of how to use a metaphyseal um, uh, defect uh, using the cones or other wedges? So again, this will be dealt when we are taking revision classes, or if possible, we will try to record and we will post in the WhatsApp group at least the sleeves or the cones. Whenever we are doing, we will just take a short video and we will post it. okay sir and also please uh, give us the indication and how to use it also because we are not well versed with those things so like again i said these are most commonly used in your uh, revision scenarios so there is something yeah. called as jones classification a uh, jones fixation 
where your epiphysis, metaphysis, and diaphysis. There are three zones of fixation. Now you need to have at least two zones of fixation. Whenever you have deficiency of more than two, that if your epiphysis is lost because of the bone loss, you have a huge void in your metaphysial, this one, then you have to use your sleeves to replace your metaphysial bone. And sometimes you need to add your extension rods to have a diaphysial fixation. That is what the, you need to have at least fixation in two zones. Sir, sir uh, uh, in presence of some bone defects that is centrally located uh, uh, during the TBR preparation, if this defect is there and you are putting uh, before putting uh, a drill and the triple jigs, whatever it may be, uh, uh, putting the pins, it is even not uh, facing any problem because these pins are getting uh, loose. Correct. Uh, so, so any instrumentation, if you take, they have given more options to put your pins. There are options on the anterior side. There are options on the posterior side. So if you feel if you are a pin will come in the way of your defect, then you can use some other places. Like you can give one anteriorly on the medial side and one posterior on the lateral side. You can have varied options. Even if, uh, if the defect is in uh, posterior medial, uh, it will address that uh, defect uh, as per the, the size of the defect. If you put the screw in posterior medial side with the bone graft, it is very difficult, sir. Uh, for a 3.5 mm screw putting in posterior side, posterior medial corner, uh, we are facing some kind of problem. Eh, the either screw driver is not going uh, in that way. I, how you people are sir, addressing that, that kind of defect? You are taking more chunks or you are preparing the bed more and putting the more uh, big bone graft and uh, coming to medial, more medial. How you are addressing, sir? No, I, we are not facing any problem. See, actually, you are completely dislocating how you do your runs and bring your tibia completely anterior. Yeah, you yeah, put yeah, a spike yeah, okay. on the medial side. You have a very good uh, access completely on the entire medial side, including the posterior medial corner also. So if you can just uh, send a picture or any video of what exactly you are facing, then we can tell you. Because as per, uh, we are not facing any problem with this. Okay, sir, I can send you a uh, yeah, defect with the videos. Sir, in a borderline case, uh, what, how to decide whether to put an augment or a bone graft with a screw? So again, again, an augment may not be able uh, compatible with all the primary implants you are using. There are very less amount, uh, very less companies which gives options of fitting an augment or wedge to a primary implants. Okay. So you see which implant you are using, whether they are compatible for fixation of your augments or wedges or not. And usually it is more than 10 millimeters where we would go for augments. Less than 10 millimeter or 5 millimeter once you take your tibia cut, once you do your uh, sizing of the tibia and remove the additional osteophytes, you will be less left with less than 5 to 10 millimeter, which can be easily dealt with cement or cement with screws. Does osteoporosis play a role in deciding the option? Uh, see, uh, osteoporosis, again, uh, we never downsize your components in osteoporosis. Always try to use an upper upper end of the sizes because you need to have a four wall uh, support. Second thing, whenever you are having an osteoporosis, you definitely add an uh, extension rods on the TBL side at least. Press with TBL uh, uh, extension rods. So one more question. Have you encountered any femoral defects as such and used a femoral rod? Because we are talking more about the TBL defects. So Yes. How much? Again, again about the, the femur defects defects? on the femoral side are most commonly seen in your rheumatoid patients. So you have a big cyst in the uh, the after your distal cut and your chamfer cut. Sometimes you have a marginal defects. 
uh, of the cyst. Once you scrape out, there will be big defect. So in these conditions, you use an extension rod. Mm -hmm. There are one or two occasions where we had to use one or two screws in the femur also. When we are using wedges in the tibia, sir, is it extension rod necessary or it's optional? It's always better to use your stem whenever you use your wedges or augments. Because again, it helps in transfer of at least 30% of additional load. Even so if we are using bone graft. Zones fixation, right? Zones fixation. So whenever there is a defect of more than 10 millimeter, in that condition, you are going to add your wedges, right? So you yes. have a deficient epifacial fixation there. You have a deficient metafacial fixation. Now, if you are not going, if you are just going to add your augment there, so you are left with only one zone of fixation. So in order to have additional zone of fixation, you need to add your extension rod here. What even with the even if we are fixing with the bone graft, same. Yes, yes, correct. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Now, if your bone graft absorbs in the future, what will do? Because you are, you, there is no guarantee that your bone bone graft is going to incorporate osteointegrate there. So it's better should... to use a stem there. Yeah, thank you. Sir. Yes, Abhay. In, in this stem, sir, what are the indications for a cemented stem? Because most of the times I have uh, used this the uncemented stems only. But any specific indication for a cemented stem? So, uh, cemented stems usually whenever you are using a very short stubby stems. Okay. So because see, when you use a very small, like if you use your PFC, they have a size thirty, smallest ones. Mm -hmm. So these will be completely the metaphyseal region, right? Mm -hmm. It is not going to end in the diaphysis and have a diaphyseal fixation. Okay. So in this condition, if your tibia, which is very wide in the metaphysis, both in AP and me. ML plane, and you use only a short stem without any cement, it is not going to have any sort of fixation in a metaphysis. So, in this condition, it is advisable to use a uh, cemented one. But preference, your own preference would be a long diaphysial uh, fitting stem. So what is the, in general, uh, uh, you know, protocol in sunshine? Would you go for a a diaphysial fit uh, uncemented stem or whenever in, it is needed? In primary, our choice is to go for a short short stems. Cemented short stem. Yes. Yes, cemented. Or you can even in, you see sometimes you have 50 lengths. Then you go for an hybrid fixation where you use only at the plate, base plate to the cement and the stem you just leave it. So it may not give you 100% of weight transfer. At least 50 to 60 percent of the weight transfer will be possible from there. But suppose you have turn a bone graft, even in that case, a bone graft screw fixation. When I done. use a bone graft, then I use a long stem. Long stem. Long stem. Right. Okay. Thanks. Without, I'm just telling uh, if I'm not using my bone graft, then short stem. If at all you are using augments or wedges or you do a bone grafting, definitely long stem. Long means sir, 100, 800. So again, it, which system you are using? The uh, you gives at the uh, sizes of 75, then 115. Buccal Papa's give at 50 and 75. Meryl use at okay. 70 and 100, 40, 70 and 100. So depending on what system you are using. Okay. So again, again, in this condition, whenever I am using a long stem or we are using a long stem, we never cement the stem. We try to use thick, thick, uncemented stems. Sir, my question is about the weight bearing protocol. If you have put a large defect, uh, put a large graft with a screw, so what about the weight bearing? Immediate, immediate or weight immediate? bearing? No change. Immediate in the, weight bearing. Yeah, yeah. Immediate, immediate full weight bearing. bearing. In full weight bearing, immediate. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Thank you. Sir. I think we are done. Most of the questions are answered.
just this uh, one question about uh, 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 injection pause uh, or uh, trial trial uh, tranexamic acid. You are you are routinely using locally also? No, no, we are not using. In Only hips, we, in hips we used to use for a couple of cases. But when it comes to knee, we are using only IV. Only IV. Okay. Yeah. And do you do post op also? Uh, Actually, we are not following it. But again, uh, literature says that uh, if you after uh, even uh, four hours from the surgery, to a people who are using brain, mm -hmm. you keep your brain in a, uh, a locked Lock. position for Lock. four Lock. hours from the surgery. When you release your brain. If the collection in the drain is more than 200 ml, mm -hmm. so they asked to repeat 500 mg of tranexamic acid and clamp your drain once again okay. for another four hours and release it after four more hours. Still, it is continuing, then you need to clamp it permanently and add another 500 mg of tranexamic acid. Mm -hmm. okay. But to a people who are not using drain, if there is a significant soakage in the post-operative period, your wound is getting soaked, you need to change the dressings in less than four to six hours after the surgery, you may add, uh, repeat your tranexamic acid. Yeah. But as a, as a protocol, you don't give. So no, no, no. We are not giving. You give at the time of incision. Correct. Yes. Not incision. Uh, immediately after Just the induction, we give antibiotic and tranexamic acid. Half an hour before surgery. Yes. Just prior to incision. Correct. Correct. Approximately. Okay, okay guys. To be given prior to putting tunicate. Am I right? Antibiotics and tranexamic acid should be... Yes, yes. Both, so both that is what I said. Anything. Immediately after you induce your patient, give your antibiotic as well as tranexamic acid. Because after your induction, you will wait for a couple of minutes for your spinal to act in. Then you do your part preparation. Then you, you apply your tourniquet. Then do you do scrubbing. So all this procedure will take approximately 30 to 40 minutes. So that time is enough for your antibiotics to have an maximum MIC at the in the blood. Same time your tranexa half-life is also 90 minutes. So it is decent enough. So along with the antibodies only as a protocol it will be given. Correct. Good. That's very good. Use any cold packs the post op for those fixed ones, cold packs? Yes, yes. I actually forgot to mention that, but ice packs and cryotherapy definitely help, yes. But you can use it all patients, those ones, those are fixed to the knee. Sorry? No, no, you get those uh, cryotherapy bandages. Yeah, yeah. Kind of we have started yeah, yeah. recently have, using yeah. cryotherapy and it is wonderful. It's very yeah. wonderful. So what, we, we give for 15 minutes uh, a fixed hourly. Okay. Yeah. So there is uh, a machine, then there is a just like a knee brace and it's very good. Your patients are very happy after your cryotherapy. Uh, uh, after and in case your cryotherapy is not available, then you can ask your patients to do ice packs. Yeah. Uh, after the surgery, how much time after the surgery? So so usually we are advising on POD1 only because you have a thick compression dressing. So your cryo won't work at that stage, right? So the next day morning, when we change the compression dressing, we just put a curopod dressing. Nothing else. No crepe bandages. Nothing. Unless there is some soakage. Are, are we uh, going to uh, have some revision topics also during this? No, no, no. We don't have any revision topics here. So I think last, that would be the last concluding talk next week. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, sir. Bye. Good night, Bye. sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.